We're uh, on the beat with uh, Tony Maroney, and we have Kayvon from Kayvon TV here. Uh, Kayvon's been interviewing uh, rock stars for uh, how many years? Oh, I've been going on for at least, uh, you know, in the last, uh, I would say, five, six years at least. Uh, and, and, you know, having the Kayvon TV program of both uh, the web channel and also having it on uh, Canadian television um, you know, for a little while. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I would say about five, six year period uh, going going off and on with, um, you know, artists and bands and groups that, you know, those are I particularly take an interest in. And sometimes, you know, that, uh, you know, been attending music festivals or, um, you know, conferences and whatnot that are in town. And that's, uh, that's a big passion of mine. Music is, um, is an interesting subject and field for me because I find that, um, Musicians usually that that, that sort of field, uh, music itself, they offer a lot more interesting and fascinating stories than most people in certain other fields of life. Better, better than politicians, I oh, think. Oh, definitely, it. definitely a lot more. Have you ever more. had to interview a politician or a politician who wanted to be a rock star? I actually, I actually have. Um, uh, you know, uh, I've, 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 you know, I've, I've had. It wasn't the, Bill? Uh, no, 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 nothing uh, of that note. I mean, oh. more on a local level, and you know, sort of um, have been. You know, I guess you know lucky enough to sort of have um, you know the odd brush with uh, you know with the politicians themselves but it's not it's not as to me it's not really as there's no fun in it really because you know you don't in, in music and, and I guess in sports as well um, the, the, you know the athletes and musician thing what you get with that is you um, you find that they have more of a, a interesting background and history to them uh, they obviously either form their own uh, groups or lineups and and you know obviously you know split off and did their own thing whether it was a solo going or you know they had their own um, uh, musical end or endeavors in a band I think it's always more um, you know neat to, to know that a musician has um, so much you know whether it's the dirt dirt or you know it's the um, oh okay what the about the dirt about the dirt <laughs> get, get, what's the dirtiest story you've heard or what's the well, the, I, I the greatest really, story you've got I, from dirt. I couldn't really tell you that. Obviously, I, I, I want to keep this sort of tame. But I, I've heard some really far out, outrageous stories that you would think you know a normal person would never do in their lifetime. And, and, and how, the about, musicians, how about the women you see backstage? Uh, do they give you any dirt stories? Yeah, well, that's, that's where half that's, the stories come from. That's kind of more. That's more rare, but uh, you do get some of that actually. And I'm, I've been absolutely blown away by some of the stuff they're willing to reveal to me. I mean, it's like, um, you know, you should sort of keep some stuff. You know, some stuff should be better left unsaid. But yet, they're ready. They're they're willing to spill the beans. I guess it's just they're ready to open up to me. I don't know how uh, how to put it. But there's some crazy, crazy stories and what. What people like that did, I mean, in the heyday of their careers, or you know, uh, and, and most of these stories, like this, doesn't go on nowadays. I don't. Not think as so not as not as much. No, no. no, I wouldn't say no. It's so, not. It's so, not uh, I don't think where these do the days stories come from? Like the eighties? Would you say the eighties were the heyday of they were. these? For me, uh, for me, they were. For the eighties, to hear these stories coming from the eighties means more to me because I was a child of the eighties, and so child of the eighties and nineties, really. So I mean, uh, I I think uh, you know when it comes to certain bands, whether they be you know, hair bands, or you know, I, I mean, um, yeah, new wave bands, even, or you know, um, it just all these genres of uh, musicians, they they seem to get into these sort of high stakes adventures and thrills, and and uh, you, it's almost like a myth when you hear about it because nobody can really confirm if it's true unless they tell you, like from the horse's mouth, word of mouth, sort of thing. Right, right. Yeah, so you're you're not the kind of guy that's going to repeat these things because then it becomes se second no, hand like news and third hand news, and, precisely. and by the time gets I'm I'm fin by the time I'm finished with the story, it's it's uh, basically the guy had jumped from the CN Tower type of thing. Parachuted uh, off or something uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah. You get these sort of stories, yeah, like you said, they, they get twisted around and uh, by the third hand or fourth hand telling, it's like, who made this stuff up? You know, that's not true. And I don't want it coming back to me, you know, so you just sort of stay, stay in get a drift of that, you know. Okay, and so today we're here at the Mod Club, and uh, you're about to interview uh, Dave um, from the English Beat. I can't think of a more appropriate setting, Tony, than the Mod Club here in Toronto, because for all these years, I've always wanted to do an interview with Dave, a live on-camera sit-down interview, and we never really found a, a purpose or a focus to do it, but I think the Mod Club, with the, with the band playing here tonight for the very first time here, they wanted to play here ages ago, and David always mentioned, what's a good place in Toronto I could play other than, you know, Lee's Palace or Horseshoe Tavern or outside of, you know, the smaller club uh, places. And I always thought, you know, Mod Club, when he suggested that to me and uh, thought if I approved, you know, knowing Dave, 
um, I said, you know what, that would fit the mould of a band like yours perfectly. And there is, just just look at this, I mean, like, you know, it, it, yeah, the, the <laughs> you've got that it's sort of uh, the motifs painted on, and uh, you know, even the owner of this place was a former 80s rock star in the heyday, Mark Holmes. Uh, you know, who uh, pr promotes here and that, so and does his DJ and, gig. And we did have Chris Steffler on, uh, That's right. on, on the beat uh, talking. Yeah, so, so, you know, that sort of plays a hand in it too, and, uh, you know, with seeing the Ben Sherman motifs and the, you know, the, um, uh, the mod bullseye targets, and, and just it, it goes back to that, harkens back to this area where it was hip, and, you know, Dave always, you know, sported the Fred Perry tops and was thrown right into that sort of scene too, you know, as much as he was, you know, in the ska and punk sort of, um, you know, 80s uh, music scene. There was and, always the and, mod and element. And Dave went from uh, the English beat to general yeah. public, or he was did. He did. He formed uh, after the beat. He went on with uh, Ranking Roger from the beat uh, to go ahead and form this new lineup, uh, General Public, which took uh, members of the beat, him and Ranking Roger, the Specials, uh, in Horace Panther, the bass player, and uh, members of uh, uh, the Dexys Midnight Runners in the uh, drummer um, uh, Stoker Gracott and um, Mickey Billingham on keyboard. So he incorporated all the elements of that. that that, that band scene from you know the Coventry Birmingham sort of mix that was really really a super group for me and that was my favorite like it, it, it was more for me discovering Dave Wakeling and his music through general public than it was for the beat because I still find that the beat were a little bit before my time you know um, having been born right then in 1980 um, don't want to give away my age but you know you know You're the not general 20 public years old 15 no, no, 20 years old you know it's I don't know I'm just sort of stuck stuck in a time capsule you know like we're very well preserved but um, and I'm, I'm still I'm still 13 on the 13 years old on it's, the outside it's the Freddie Mercury jeans yeah it yeah. must be it must be Freddie yeah I'm channeling him and you know that's that's sort of what it is but no the real th the real thing about uh, finding out about Dave and you know the, the beat I had to go through general public first and uh, hearing the hits on the radio, you know, I've heard more, more of my share of general public tunes than I really did, for, um, you know, the beat. But that, that doesn't say that I don't like the beat equally, and I think that, uh, you know, if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't have general public, and obvious, that's an obvious fact. And um, both of them, both of the band's music is so relevant to me, even today, and, um, and the, the fans of both bands, obviously, you know, they'll hand in hand almost in a way, even though, you know, I will say general public had more of that new wave um, sort of um, 80s feel to it than, than I would say the beat, because the beat revolved around, more around that um, ska and punk and, you know, um, you know, that sort of heyday era of the late 70s and early 80s, of course. Keep talking, keep talking. So anyway, um, yeah, no, um, I, think it's, um, I think it's brilliant that um, Dave's managed to keep the music going and uh, been able to, uh, you know, bring it, uh, bring it to audiences over here on these shores. Uh, certainly I know Ranking Roger and, um, uh, you know, Everett Morton, um, original members of The Beat, along with uh, Mickey Billingham from uh, Dexys Midnight Runners and General Public, they've, they've been able to keep that lineup going on that side. So it's a wonderful and refreshing thing to know that both lineups still perform today and do their own bits and takes on the, on the songs, and I, I like that, and I've been one of the very few lucky enough to see both lineups of, uh, of the beat, and, um, uh, you know, and of course, uh, uh, I think it's, a, I think it's um, a bit of a marvel that, you know, um, someone as lucky as myself got, got that opportunity as of last year when I saw the other beat lineup for the first time, it just blew me away, and I, I, I said, you know, just, just something that is missing in the void in my heart that I always wish that Dave and uh, the other guys could sort of bring it back together. But it's very difficult when you've got an ocean separating you and it, it, it's, it's not always the real reality to, to, for that to happen. But you never know, they've done reuni a reuni one of reunion before, so it could happen again. But I've got to say, Dave Wakeling is lined up here with the English Beat here in, um, in, in North America. That, they are so tight and they're such a great lineup and he's really found the right mix of musicians to you know sort of uh, bring back that sort of um, live sound of the, of the tunes and uh, obviously you know when you hear it played live it doesn't sound any different and I think you can't fault either of the lineups for for their um, sort of their musicianship. So. Okay well, well we're going to wrap this and we've been speaking to Kayvon from Kayvon uh, TV and this is uh, On The Beat with Tony Maroney and uh, we'll be uh, right back with um, the man himself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dave Wakeling, thank you, Tony, for doing this.
So, um, it's, it's been how long we've known each other now, Dave? And I've been 15 coming, years, is it? Yeah, at least 15, 16 years I've been coming to Beat Gigs, uh, um, you know, and uh, we, we, we talked about this obviously earlier, that I am one of the very lucky few who had the sort of distinction and, uh, you know, I guess the... Um, I, 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 I don't know how it happened, but it was just really chance being over there in England last year in May. I got to finally realise my lifelong dream of seeing the other lineup of the uh, of the beat, and obviously, um, you know, a member of general public in there, in in, uh, in Mickey Billion, which I was I'm really thrilled about. Um, even though Blockhead's gone, but you know, I mean, um, it's uh, it's it's really something. Gone but not forgotten. Never forgotten. No, absolutely not. It's funny because you know I was telling Tony here that the, the reason I really got into your music, you'd be stunned. But, you know, being a child of the 80s and 90s, I first got into general public before I ever got into the beat. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, you know, knowing general public and, and being a fan of their music and Fine Young Cannibals, that's sort of like how I came across the whole beat thing for me. And I always, there was a period when I was so young and I was growing up in England and I always thought that you somehow were the twin brother of Martin Fry. And I don't know how that came up, but maybe I was, it was the short runt twin. It, it was maybe the fact that... I was the that, runt of his litter, I must have been. He's terribly tall, isn't he? <laughs> he is a tall guy, He's yeah. He's a lovely fella. He is, isn't he? A, rom a true romantic. And also, the thing that you share in common with him is certainly the Motown stuff. I, I think that you always had a love of the Motown... Um, I hear violins, I do. Vibe. It, it, when Smokey sings, I hear violins. But Smokey Robinson, obviously, in The Miracles, and you were a, a huge, massive fan of the Four Tops. And can you describe, obviously, being from Brum, uh, being the sort of the motor city of, of uh, the UK, yep. and obviously Detroit being uh, the motor city of the States, like Sheffield's the motor city of... Oh dear. Knives and forks. Knives and forks. Let me get your glasses for oh, you. Oh, yeah. You carry on, the camera's there. The Go, we, don't we have... lose the crowd, don't lose your audience. Never well, I will never, never take my eyes off the cameras. Tony always yeah. told me that. So, basically, you know, Birmingham being the steel city and, you know, steel town, Burm Brum was uh, basically a, a motor, motor town and yeah. motor vehicles, manufacturing yeah. and that. And um, does, did that sort of resonate, how sort of Motown found a way into your heart? From a young age? I thought this was going to be like a conversation, because when we have conversations, me and you, I don't say anything. <laughs> no, this interview started off pretty well, I thought. You were get looking as well, you were going to ask a question, then you'd answer it, change the subject, move towards another question, then steer away from it with another of your own answers, as we do when you're conversing. So I'm completely unprepared for this, and now you've stopped talking. Oh dear. Because it was the same as usual, I wasn't listening to the last five minutes, I'm sure it was right. Whatever he said. Yes. So, so no, I've always liked Motown. I'm, I, I don't know why I liked it. I like the beat of it, and then I really liked. Um, I really liked the, the emotional quality of it. Don't walk away, Renee, and burn the debt. Right. Four tops for me, particularly. There was something about it when he just sang and shouted like that. It made me jump up like this, you know. And um, there was something effortless and stylish and powerful mm -hmm. about it. And uh, so I was always a fan. But we were very lucky in England because there was only one radio station. And so you had the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, the Kinks, Sandy Shaw, Silla Black. Right. And Tamla Motown, it was called in England, sure, Tamla yeah. Motown. And so we never knew you weren't meant to listen to the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Smokey Robinson and the Four Tops. We thought, in fact, you were meant to because that's what we were playing. So, so it was fed to you anyway. Yes. So. And we were happy of it. Uh, so we were very surprised when we first came here. When we came to New York and, and somebody was playing the radio in the car and we thought it sounded crap. So like, nothing better than that, you know, what sort of stuff you look for. And, and they said, oh, you mean, oh, you need a, a black station? We're like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're talking like, you're talking like kind of black radio? I was like, black? Radio? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we thought he was joking. We thought he was joking. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, the, the interesting thing was, um, you, um, you originally were on the two-tone label, the beat were. Yes. And the first single was a Smokey Robinson cover. Lo and behold, Tears of a Clown came out. And then what happened was, this is interesting because um, two-tone really was a new thing back then. You know, we were talking late 70s and basically... Um, Really, to be honest, it didn't really originate in, in Brum. It was in Coventry, down the um, right. down the motorway there. And not far. Not far, though. 17 mile. But Precisely. Not but we end. hate each other. <laughs> I can it imagine. Was a sign, we said it was a sign of the magic of two-tone, of how powerful that music must be, that people from Birmingham and Coventry could actually tolerate each other, because <laughs> it had never happened before. 
No. Never. Not in football circles, we know. Yeah, certainly not in football circles. So Never. Never.